everyone. In today's lecture, we will look at um, two topics. The first one will be risk and return, followed by time value of money. I'm going to just uh, go, to, go through briefly uh, for both topics and the uh, detailed uh, the examples with detailed calculations will be covered in, uh, in class. Now, uh, let's go to risk and return first. Now, these two terms, risk and returns, are, are common. Okay, you have uh, uh, encounter uh, or read, okay, come across these uh, terms frequently. Uh, it's just that from finance perspective, there's a uh, uh, slight difference okay, um, in terms of the calculation and also the interpretation. Now, originally, risk and return uh, derives from mathematics or statistics. Okay? So we uh, actually apply some of the uh, statistical um, computations or way of uh, calculating uh, both risk and returns. Now in finance, we focus on the risk and returns of financial uh, securities or instruments, okay? particularly in measuring or calculating the, uh, the, the loss or the return Okay, of an investment, okay, for example. Now let's focus on return first. Okay, there are various types of returns. First one would be uh, the simple holding period return, okay, whereby um, you invest in a, uh, a security okay, or an asset, okay, and after some time, it grows. Okay? So you can actually measure by how much it grows. So this is translated into the uh, holding period uh, return. So this is the uh, conventional way of calculating this type of holding period return. And the second line here is a, a much shorter or sim a simplified way of calculating the same return. Right. Now, the second type of return is um, where you have two uh, return components. Uh, so in this case, you purchase a stock and from ten dollars, uh, it grows to become eleven, and at the same time, during the year, it pays dividend two dollars. So we have what we call the capital gain component, and as well as the uh, dividend yield uh, component. So in this case, the uh, total return uh, would be thirty percent, combination of both capital gain as well as the dividend uh, yield. So these two are examples of what we call the actual or realized uh, return. Okay. And we, we also have what we call the expected uh, return, okay, which uh, uh, has not been recorded yet, but is projected okay, based on certain uh, economic data okay, or uh, concepts. So in this case, we apply the uh, probabilities of the economic condition. Okay, so let's say we want to um, uh, have... Uh, uh, we want to make predictions okay, of uh, two stocks, stocks A and B, and um, over the next year. And we have three possible state of uh, the economy, a boom, normal, and recession, each with um, an assigned probability okay, for the state of economy to occur. And um, in each state, right, both stocks will uh, all are expected to record different uh, level of returns. Okay? So in this case, uh, simply what we do is that for uh, each stock, we would multiply the uh, assigned probability with the expected uh, return during that state of the economy. Right? And we add on with the second uh, state as well as the third state of the economy. And it turns out to be 9.99% of stock A and 17.77% for stock B. Okay. So, so far we have um, uh, computed the expected return. Okay. So, although stock B is expected to, to, to record a higher uh, rate of return, okay, we also are interested in the variability. Okay. Variability means uh, uh, the, uh, how it deviates from the mean. Right? So notice that um, the return for stock B can be 
25%, 20%, or as low as 1%. Uh, for stock A, can be 15, 10, or 2. So, um, from the naked eye, we can see that there is um, variation, okay? fluctuations uh, in the return, but um, we would like to standardize it. We would like to quantify it to come up with uh, a measure. Okay? So, that's why we apply the statistical measure of variance as well as the standard deviation. Right? So in, in other applications of uh, standard deviation and, and variance um, may not be um, the same okay, or similar to the ones we apply in finance, right? So when we talk about uh, natural um, occurrences, okay, like the uh, weather uh, catastrophes such as earthquake, typhoon, or even uh, uh, the risk of losing an election, or even in medical science, okay? even as uh, straightforward as your weight or height, the deviation or uh, variance uh, refer to how much you differ or deviate from the mean. Right? But when you are below the mean, it does not necessarily mean that it is bad. Right? But in finance, we are more interested in what we call the semi-variance concept. Okay? Uh, for example, if let's say the positive deviation okay, for a stock price, for example, it shows that uh, by how much it is above the mean. Okay? So the negative variation, okay, the, the, the proportion when it is below uh, the, the mean price, it may not be uh, good in this sense okay, when we apply it to the stock price concept for example so although we are using the statistical measure there are certain differences when it comes to uh, application and another thing is that we attach uh, the uh, risk preference okay, which actually comes from the behavioral finance uh, uh, area okay, uh, or theory okay, when um, we apply this uh, risk measure uh, because they are, we, we classify the investors into uh, three different uh, categories. Okay? Risk averse, okay, whereby the main priority is to reduce as much uh, risk as possible. Uh, risk indifferent would be uh, investors are indifferent okay, to, to the risk return profile okay, of the investment. And there is another uh, um, uh, group okay, or category which is risk taker. So there are actually three uh, types. Okay? Uh, and then um, let's look at the measure. Okay? So first and foremost, you need to calculate the variance. Okay? Uh, after calculating the variance, um, you uh, square root it to become standard deviation. And uh, more times than not, we will use standard deviation as the uh, benchmark to, to compare the risk uh, uh, the riskiness of financial securities. Okay, let's use the same uh, example with the three states of uh, economy. Okay. So how do we calculate the uh, variance? Right? Now, um, remember the assigned probability of 30%, 50%, and 20% of each state of the economy, right? And remember the mean or the average that we have calculated. So the expected return here serves or functions as what we call the average okay? uh, return. So average return for stock A is 9.99% and the average return for stock B is 17.7%. So what we do is in each state, okay, since uh, it, for stock A, okay, in the boom uh, state of the economy, it is expected to record 15%. Okay, so we deduct it with the average, which is 9.9%. And then the difference, you square them, and then you multiply with the uh, probability of 30% or 0 0.3. And you do the same for stock B and stock C. Right? And you will, at the end, you will get uh, a, a variance. And when you square root it, you will get 4.5%. Another way of doing it is um, the Probability you maintain as uh, uh, 0 0.3 okay, using the uh, this uh, way of calculating 0 0.3 instead of 30. But the 
inside the parenthesis for the return, you make it 15 minus 9.9. .9. Here is 10 minus 9.9, .9, and here is 2 minus 9.9. .9. Okay, the reason for doing it this way is to, to not make it messy. Okay, it does not involve a lot of small numbers like this, right? But if you do this, have to you have to be careful okay? because um, after you get 20.9, okay, which is a summation of all this. Uh, you straight away square root it to become 4.5 and this 4.5 you assign a percentage to make it 4.5 percent so it is up to you uh, whichever way you are more comfortable and confident with okay, you, uh, if you are not that uh, uh, confident okay, uh, for fear that you will do um, miscalculation or uh, wrongly calculated so you maintain the first way okay, which involves uh, calculating or writing down the whole numbers as, as they are. Okay, so what does this 4.5 um, entail? Okay, it shows that on average, okay, the uh, return in each state of the economy okay, deviates from the mean okay, by about 4.5%. So that is the measure of uh, deviation, the standard measure of deviation. If you apply the same uh, calculation for stock B, you will get 8.63 percent showing that the stock B has a higher okay, uh, variability okay from the mean it deviates from the mean um, uh, higher or uh, uh, in a larger proportion compared to stock A okay. so what we have here is that if you summarize it this way you can see that a stock B okay, uh, provides a higher expected return but it also uh, records a higher risk okay, through a higher standard deviation uh, measure. Right? So we can apply this coefficient of uh, variation okay, in order to uh, to determine okay, based on the risk and return uh, profile which of these two stock is considered as um, better. Right. So when we apply this coefficient of variation, whereby we take the standard deviation and divide it with the expected return. Okay, what we uh, get is that the coefficient of variation for stock A is 0 0.45, whereby for stock B is 0 0.48. Right? So although okay, stock B provides a higher expected return, stock A uh, risk per unit of return, which is measured by the coefficient of uh, uh, variation, is much lower. Okay? So therefore, uh, stock A is better. Okay. And this is also tally with the uh, assumption, the main assumption okay, in, in finance, whereby we uh, assume that most investors are reservers. Okay. So this is tally with the uh, reservers okay, uh, assumption. Okay. So due to the fact that um, we assume most investors are reservers, so in this case, since stock A, a risk per unit of return is lower. So we say that uh, stock A is better in this case, even though stock B uh, promise a higher expected rate of return. Okay, those are in um, a single uh, asset case. Now we uh, turn into portfolio. What, it, what happens when you lump or you put together uh, several uh, securities or investments into one basket or one portfolio. So mathematically, it's not that difficult. You just have to determine the weight for each uh, investment or each asset in the portfolio. So let's say you have this info, you invest this much in stock A, 2,000, 3,000 in stock B, 4,000 in stock C, and 6,000 in stock D. First and foremost, you determine the weight first. Okay, So the total uh, investment in this portfolio comes to uh, 15,000, right? So you will determine this uh, a specific weight for each uh, stock in the portfolio. Okay? Then you find what uh, are the expected returns for each uh, stock. So these are the assigned expected return for each stock. So what you do then is simply multiply the weight okay, for uh, each stock with its expected uh, return. And you do this, um, do it for all four uh, assets or four stocks, and this will give you the 
portfolio return as a whole. Right? Um, so you notice that um, depending on the weight, okay, so in order to increase the, um, the, the portfolio of return, we would want a higher weight, okay, more weightage, okay, or to invest more in stocks that uh, uh, promise a much higher return, which are stock A uh, and D in this case. Okay, let's look at the uh, example. Okay. So you have this uh, data okay, for expected return for Malaysia and Singapore in terms of this uh, stock market. And you have this assigned probability to each uh, state of the economy. So we have bullish, normal, and bearish. Okay. So for Malaysia, it's 20, 12, and 1, and Singapore is 18, 15, and 3% respectively. Okay. So calculate the expected uh, stock market return okay, for each country. Okay. Uh, standard deviation as well as coefficient of uh, variation. So for Malaysia, it's just simply uh, the weight okay, for bullish times the return. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the return, which is 20%, plus the weight for normal, 60, 0.6 times uh, the return. Okay, and for the third one, uh, bearish, 15% uh, times uh, 1%. So you will get 12.35% expected return for Malaysia. Okay, and for standard deviation, we, we use a similar uh, approach um, as in the example earlier, and you will get 5.83%. If we do the same for Singapore, the expected rate is 13.95. Okay? So much higher than Malaysia's at 12.35%. What about the risk? Okay, uh, Ironically, for Malaysia, it's 5.83, and the standard deviation for Singapore is 4.77. Over here, even without uh, calculating the coefficient of variation, okay, we know for a fact that uh, Singapore is better because um, with the higher expected return, it also has a lower standard deviation. Right? But we can prove it by calculating the uh, coefficient of variation. And it is proven that for Singapore, it's much lower, 0 0.3419, whereas Malaysia is 47.21%. Now, if you invest 400,000 in Malaysian stock market and 600,000 in Singaporean stock market, what is the expected return? So you have the weight already. So the total is 1 million. So the weightage for Malaysia is 40%. The weightage for Singapore is 60%. And you multiply with the respective expected return for each country. So the portfolio return okay, in this case would be 13.31%. Now let's go to the time value of money. Okay. Um, as you notice, I provide you with this uh, lecture note, which is about 40 plus pages for you to, to go through. Okay. And um, it is uh, quite uh, self-explanatory. Most I provide with uh, lots of examples, right? And uh, the early part here is where I explain about time value of money and why is it important, right? In our life, in the economy, right? Particularly in the financial markets when it involves financial instruments. Uh, there is also a misconception uh, about uh, time value of money, particularly in the, uh, the power of compounding. I think the power of compounding here is a very uh, important uh, concept. I narrate a, a story, even though this is an ancient story, which we could not verify whether it's true or not, but it's a good example to show the power of compounding, right? And then I start off with the simple interest, right? Um, even though, of course, the focus would be on compound interest, but it is also important to look at simple interest. Uh, how it is calculated, okay, which is simply the principal times the uh, simple interest rate times the time uh, period. Yeah. Now, um, it has some applications okay, in, in everyday uh, lives, particularly in uh, certain types of loans right, and certain types of financing facilities okay, uh, provided by businesses. Right? So it, it is also being uh, applied. Okay, over there. 
Okay. And then we focus on compound uh, interest. I explain uh, what is compound interest, the concept of uh, compounding, which you have, uh, most of you may have this uh, prior knowledge already. It's just that uh, you may want to refresh or review uh, by referring to the notes and compare here the, the difference in terms of calculation between simple interest as well as the uh, compound interest. Right. So we start off with um, we divide the the, the 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 discussion into single amount and also annuity. Okay, let's go through a single amount uh, case first. So there are two uh, main values that we want to calculate: the future value and also the present uh, value. Okay. So my approach here is um, uh, I use formula. The reason I use formula is that. Um, it is this formula, um, de deriving from this formula, that other applications are created, be it using Excel, financial calculator, or scientific calculator, or even the tables. Okay? So that's number one. And secondly, the formula that I'm using here, okay, I modify it a little bit. Okay? So you will not, um, you will see that uh, some textbooks will have different formulation but the reason i'm using this is so that you understand um what entails or what involves in each item or variable and then further along as we go along and also applying time value of money in other areas such as bond valuation stock valuation capital budgeting it is easier for you to follow and to understand okay all right, <clears throat> to find the future value okay, at the end of um, N periods, we call it N periods, you need a P, which is a principal amount, okay, times uh, 1 plus okay, this J divided by M okay, is actually this I here. Okay, so the, the basic formula is here. Okay, the basic root formula. Okay, it's basically this one, where I is uh, explained by J divided by M, and N is actually T times M. So what is J divided by M? Okay, J here okay, is actually the nominal or stated interest rate. You can also call it the quoted rate. So when bank says, okay, we uh, offer this uh, facility, okay, let's say this uh, current account, your savings account at 2% okay, per year. Uh, so that 2% is called the nominal or the stated or the quoted rate. Okay. And divided by M, what is M? M is the frequency of compounding in a year. Okay, so how many times interest is compounded in a year? Okay, so if it is once a year, it is annually. If it is semi-annual, okay, two times a year. Okay, four times a year is quarterly, and every month okay, for monthly compounding, M will be 12. That is M. So your I here okay, is basically J divided by M. Okay? And this I here is called the periodic interest rate okay? because it is the nominal rate divided by the frequency of compounding. Okay. So if you see in the textbook, they straight away use this I and they call it interest rate. Okay. So it is more accurate to call it periodic interest rate rather than simply interest rate. Okay. That's why I make it J divided by M okay, to denote uh, what is the interest rate okay, applicable in that particular period because we, are not, we don't know yet the frequency of compounding. Okay. Now, to the power of N here, N refers to the uh, interest periods. So it's not simply period, okay? because interest periods is then uh, calculated as T times M, okay? which is a T is the time period in years. So if it is six months, you have to write it as 0 0.5 years. Okay? So if it's three months or a quarter, okay, one over four, which is 0 0.25, if it is 18 months, 1.5, so on and so forth. T times M will give you what we call the interest periods. Okay? So when you um, 
solve uh, problems, when you come across uh, questions, if you have a good handle of all this, okay, so you don't have to worry about the magnitude of the or the uh, what is the interest rate. It can be 0 0.02645 percent, and the time period can be hundred years, okay, or five hundred uh, months. It doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter because you will then solve it step by step. You will find j divided by m first, and then you would find what is t times m, and you will calculate it accordingly using the calculator right so let's go to example okay these are examples which you can go through on your own let's just uh, take a few right so let's say you receive 1000 today and decides to put it in an account for five years okay, so the accumulated amount at the end of five years which is a future value of course will differ based on the frequency of compounding right so if it's annual compounding, simply the principal 1,000 times 1 plus your I here would straight away be 5% okay, to the power of 5, which is 5 years. Why? Because annual compounding. Okay, This is where M equals to 1. Right. So if you go to semi-annual, uh, this is where M becomes 2. So what you need to do is you need to find your I and N accordingly so for your i remember if five percent divided by two is uh, 0 0.025 okay plus one it becomes 1.025 and to the power of 10 why 10 because uh, five years times uh, two your m okay so that's why it becomes 1.025 to the power of 10 so notice that your future value is uh, higher than the first one okay? as the uh, frequency of compounding increases Okay. So for quarterly compounding, this is where m equals to 4. Okay. And you will get feature value of 1282. For monthly compounding, okay, where m equals to 12, right? We'll get feature value of 1283.36. All right. So okay, I explained here about the um, difference okay, in the future value amount. Okay with different frequency of uh, compounding right so this is another uh, example okay of a future value application where you can um, uh, apply it on in investment uh, context and call it not interest but you call it rate of return okay? so sometimes it is interchangeable okay? for when we talk about investment okay? it is normally referred to as a rate of return right um in in banking we call it interest in economy we can call it inflation okay, to look at the uh, compound uh, compounded growth eh, in, in certain state of the economy for example okay uh, and then these are some of the uh, examples here okay uh, on how we can apply this future value concept in in real cases so in this case i compare the uh, the revenue of uh, firms okay there was a debate last time um, when titanic was released um it recorded a revenue of 1.83 billion okay, in tickets and people said that at that time this was the highest ever okay but from finance perspective if we apply time value of money okay, we would make uh, uh, another calculation so let's say we go with gone with the wind in 1940s uh, at that time the revenue was only 32 million but when we apply time value of money okay and we select a certain uh rate okay for it to 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 uh, grow okay, to make a compound growth right so in this case uh, i use the average interest rate in the US over that uh, span of time from 1940s to 1998. Okay. And when we apply that, we notice that the gone up with the wind, which recorded 32 million in 1940, okay, is equivalent to 2.36 billion in 1998 if we compound it at 7.7% .7 per year, which is the average interest rate in the US. So this is much higher than the Titanic. So this is how you, among um, 
one of the examples okay, that you can apply this uh, concept. Okay. Another one is uh, in the Malaysian context, the um, the school fees. Okay. The school fees. Um, some time ago, there was this debate. Okay. So, uh, a person shared the school fee way back in 1979, okay. uh, which was the year when I was in standard one, primary one. So they shared this photo showing that it was uh, the school fees was uh, 19 ringgit at the time and said that how cheap it was okay, compared to the school fees now. Okay, but I did some calculation and I used this 3.5%, okay, which is the average inflation rate okay, from 1970 to 2019. And it turns out that this $19 in 1979 is equivalent to 115 uh, ringgit okay, uh, in 2019, which is not that cheap anyways, so which is about similar or in some cases much higher than some of the school fees. Okay, so time value of money, in this case, the future value helps us in um, uh, identifying or in resolving certain uh, issues. Now let's go to present value. Uh, present value is basically the reciprocal. Okay. Just now, uh, knowing a, a, a starting point, which is the principle, you calculate the future value. Over here, uh, the future value is known, so you need to find the principle, which in turn is the present value in this case, so reciprocal. Uh, in textbook, they use this. Okay, they say that uh, to, to, when you reciprocate it, so the present, present value becomes a future value divided by 1 plus i to the power of n. I uh, prefer for you to write it this way or calculate it this way okay, in the same layer, which is a future value times 1 plus i to the power of negative. The negative here is uh, to show the reciprocal here. This is much better because it's much easier for you to solve it when you, you use your calculator later. The rest are all the same. i is still j divided by m. N is still T times M as earlier. So let's uh, look at an example. Uh, so now um, let's say we need 1,005 years from today. And in order to, to achieve that, uh, you decide to deposit a lump sum figure today. Interest rate is the same 5% okay, annually. Okay. Okay, let's uh, look at the example. We, we use similar format, which is uh, annual, semi-annual, quarterly, and monthly compounding. So for annual compounding, it's simple. Um, interest rate is 5% in okay, five years, so to the power of negative five. Okay? So in order to accumulate 1,000 in five years, at 5% compounded annually, you need to put in 783.53 today, right? If you go for semi-annual, okay, remember your interest rate, you have to divide by two, and for your T, you need to times two. Okay? And the PV is 781.2. So notice that it declines. Eh? It, it decreases from 783 to 781. Okay? Why is this? So because of the inverse relationship between present value and uh, interest rate. Okay. In this case, the frequency of compounding. Right? So you need a lower amount to accumulate 1,000 in five years if it is compounded semi-annually. Okay? When you do quarterly, it comes down to 780, okay? slightly lower. And when you do monthly compounding, it is 779. Okay? So applying the uh, investment rate of return earlier, Okay. So let's answer this. How much should you deposit today in an account that offers an interest rate of 7.5% compounded monthly so that your savings will be 10,000 in seven years? Okay. This is similar to the earlier question, except that the focal point now is today instead of in the future. So you can have the same set of a problem or question, okay. but uh, you can uh, calculate in both ways depending on your focal point. So you can bring forward the value to a future point, future focal point, and calculate what we call the future value. And all this also, this future value can be, uh, you can pull them okay, or, or, or 
uh, take them back, okay, discount them into today to today to calculate the present value. And they are both uh, basically equal. Okay, basically equal in the sense that they represent the same value of money. Although they have different figure, but they are the same in the sense that uh, the, the future value is what the present value will be worth at that rate and after that period, after being accumulated for a certain amount of time. So similarly, that future value is also the same as this present value with a certain, that rate and that uh, time period. Okay, so the, the conceptual, the underpinning concept is, uh, is important actually. So we can uh, calculate the present value of that 10,000, seven years uh, from now, 7.5% monthly compounding. It turns out to be 5,925 uh, to five. Okay. So you can invest 5,925 to today okay, and achieve 10,000 or accumulate 10,000 uh, ringgit in seven years. So if you take the difference, okay, this difference is 4,074 uh, is basically what you would generate. So you would generate this much. And this much that you generate is called the return. Okay? Yeah, so this return okay, is in uh, ringgit form or in dollar form. So this is the dollar return. Okay? Um, but to find the rate of return, Okay, you need to divide this with your investment. Again, you invested 5925 okay, and you get this uh, 4074. That is equivalent to 0 0.6877, which is 68.77%. So that is the total rate of return. Remember, you invest for seven years. So you need to divide by seven to get what uh, to get 9.82%. So this is your annual okay, annual rate of return right so 9.82 okay so this is another example so you can go through some of the examples on your own right and uh, the present value concept can also be applied okay in, in many areas so in this case i have done this um, uh, be, uh, some sort of research or a project which is a financial history uh, project whereby I look at the, uh, during the, the reign of uh, Emperor uh, Zudi, the Ming Emperor, with the famous uh, uh, Zhang Yi or Cheng Ho, okay, whereby um, they have a various projects. One of them, one of the mega projects was the, uh, the, the Sea Voyage, right? They have other projects as well, which was uh, the uh, Forbidden City, uh, the repairment of uh, Great Wall of China and also the uh, diversion or repairment of the Great uh, Canal. Okay, so four mega projects within a short uh, period of time. Okay, so uh, my 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 study was actually more comprehensive, but over here I just uh, uh, show you or focus on the uh, sea voyage. So my objective was to determine how much it costs actually. Okay, how much it, it costs in today's uh, money, okay, in today's uh, dollar, right? So I have um, dig out uh, the info okay, in terms of the uh, project. And in total, they built around 16,000 ships. Okay? Of course, they have various sizes. Okay? And for each ship, uh, I calculated the, the detailed cost, right, detailed cost. Okay. So I have uh, come up with all these uh, items, uh, raw materials, equipment, okay, food, salaries, wages, uh, repairs. Um, there was even rental okay, of a certain um, building and also structures okay, in order to, to build the ships. Okay. And the uh, cost, okay, in, let's focus on this column first, okay, in the year 1402. Okay, if you use US dollar, so the total would be 2 million per vessel. Okay? So if we 
okay, this two million. How do I get this two million? I go and find the current cost first, okay, and I apply present value in order to determine how much it costs at that time, okay, uh, how much it translates into in terms of the cost per vessel. So imagine there were about uh, 16,000 ships altogether. So you can imagine the magnitude of the project, right? So that is uh, basically the, um, the uh, intro for compound interest where you need to understand the uh, future value and present value concept for a single amount. Okay? So in addition to finding the future or present value, Okay, we can also find the time period as well as the interest rate okay, that is uh, 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 entailed in the problem. Okay, so in this case, uh, if you know the future value and the present value and you know the interest, so you can find the time period. Okay, so what you need to do is you basically just rearrange your formula. So in this case, you arrange, uh, rearrange the formula. It should be like this, okay, the I plus... 1 plus i to the power of n is on the left-hand side and future value divided by the present value or principle is on the right-hand side. But of course, since there is a to the power of term here, so what we need to do is, right, um, we apply, uh, uh, we, we borrow from mathematics the, the, the application of log. So once you have this term, put it here, You, uh, it, you can't solve n directly. Okay? So that's why we apply log. You log both sides. When you log both sides, what you need to do is you need to find the log for this term. Okay? And you need to find the log for this uh, term or this number. Okay? Why do we apply the log? When you apply the log, then the power of n here automatically will come down the same level or the same layer as the other terms. That is the reason why we apply the log. So once you apply the log here, n immediately comes down okay, from the power as a power term to become the normal term, which is at the same level as other terms. And now with n coming down okay, at the same level, so you can solve for n, which is basically the log for FV divided by PV. Okay, divided by, so this log 1 plus i, you bring it to the right hand side. Okay, many of you from technical background, so this is uh, not that difficult for you. So you can solve for, for n. Okay. Now, after solving for n, okay, you need to, there is another uh, layer, which is to, because the question would normally be interested in the time period, meaning how many years. Right? So remember your n is t times m. So in order to find your T, which is a time period in years, your N need to be divided by M, which is frequency of compounding at the final stage later. Okay, let's look at one example. So how long will it take for 1000 to be 1276 in an account that pays 5% interest compounded annually? Okay, so annually is quite straightforward because M equals to 1. Okay. So as I said, you don't have to memorize the formula. You, what you need to do is you need to start arranging the figures correctly okay, according to the context of the question. Okay? So you know that 1000 is the principal, 1276 is the future uh, value. Okay? So you choose this formula, okay, which is a future value formula for a single amount. Okay? So you put your future value on the left-hand side okay, and the principal on the right-hand side times 1. 0 0.05 to the power of n. So you know that you need to apply log over here. Okay, so first you uh, shift this 1.05 to the left hand side and this term to be on the right hand side, right? And basically, uh, 1276.28 divided by 1000, you know already it's 1.27628, okay? Okay, so after you uh, apply the log, uh, n will come down and it becomes like this. So you can solve for n over here. And solving for n, you know that it is equal to 5, which is 5 years. Okay? Um, yeah, I'm sure you know how to apply or how to find log using your calculator. Okay? You need at least a scientific calculator. And even 
your iPhone or your Samsung can do this, no problem, even if you don't have a proper scientific calculator. Okay, so this is another example. Uh, how long will it take for 1000 to be 1382 in an account that pays 5% interest compounded quarterly? So now the difference is that M equals to 4. So after you calculate using the similar approach earlier, you will get um, N becomes uh, 20. Okay, but this is not your final answer yet. Remember, M equals to 4. So you need to divide by 4. So the answer would be 5. Okay, 5 years. Right? Okay, this is another example. Okay. How long will it take for you to double your investment? Okay. So besides finding the time period, you can also find the interest rate. And over here, okay, uh, we still we cannot solve uh, directly. We have to use what we call an approximation okay, by way of interpolation. Okay. So notice that uh, oh, sorry, finding the interest rate. Uh, we use the algebra for annuity later we use interpolation over here it's not interpolation yet so we use a simple algebra okay whereby our uh, point of interest is i we need to find i okay so we shift one plus i to the power of n to the left hand side and that one plus i remains on the left and finally let i uh, remains on the left hand side so when you um have one plus i to the power of n equals to f v over p um, when you transfer this power of n to the right hand side, okay, it becomes a one uh, fv divided by p to the power of one over n. Okay, so this is something that we have learned many many years ago. Okay, if x to the power of a equals to y, then we can find x uh, as equals to y to the power of one over a. So this is quite straightforward. So applying this, you can solve for the interest rate. Okay, these are some of the examples. Okay, that I think you can uh, go through on your own. Okay. Effective annual rate is um, to measure the uh, effective rate of the nominal rate stated okay, based on the frequency of compounding. As we know, the different uh, frequency of compounding will result in different, eventually the different rate. And that rate is called the effective annual uh, rate. So it is basically 1 plus I, which is J divided by M to the power of M and altogether minus one. Okay. Let's look at this example. So this bank charges interest at 5%, but compounded semi-annually. Okay. So the effective annual rate uh, translates into 5.6%. Okay. So you can uh, uh, use this or apply this when you want to make comparison. So let's say another bank uh, offers at, let's say, 4.8 or 4.9 percent but compounded monthly okay so in order to determine which has a much higher effective annual rate so you apply this uh, uh, formula to make the comparison okay. uh, where you calculate the effective annual rate of a loan that charges 1.5 percent per month or here is it is already given in per month uh, basis right so you know your m equals to 12. So in order to find the effective annual rate is 1.015. You don't have to divide by 12 here because this 1.5% is already per month basis. Okay, and this is equal to 19.56%. Okay, so I ask you what loan is this? Okay, you should know this is a credit card, typical credit card loan. So um, if 1.5% you times 12, right? So most would say it's only... 18% uh, per year. Uh, effectively, it is much higher, which is 19.56%, uh, okay? almost similar to our loan rating. Okay, this is uh, uh, another example uh, of applying the effective uh, annual uh, rate, in this case, to find what is the nominal interest rate, okay? which eventually can also be called the stated or the annual percentage rate. And we apply this in um, retail, Sometimes when the store offer a certain discounts to, to some of the, uh, their products, so we apply this annual percentage uh, rate calculation. Now, what you have seen are frequency of compounding, okay, uh, 
uh, which are uh, finite, okay? Monthly, right? Uh, quarterly, okay? Or annually, right? Or you can use daily for that matter. Now, this continuous compounding, okay, is a, a concept which uh, says that interest is compounded continuously, non-stop, okay? So let's look at this uh, table for comparison. Okay, uh, we have this principle, same principle, same nominal interest rate, same time period. The only difference is the uh, frequency of compounding in a year. Okay, we, we you have seen annually, semi-annually, quarterly, and monthly before. Okay, notice that the future value increases, but the uh, the the rate at which it increases is diminishing. Okay, as you go from uh, annual to semi-annual to quarterly to monthly compounding, right? Okay, what if you do daily compounding, okay, where M equals to 365? Okay, notice that the future value will increase only slightly from 1283.36 to 1284. So it's only a matter of 64 cents uh, difference, right? Okay, so the, uh, oh, this is where the... Uh, Financial and economy supply is continuous uh, compounding, but for continuous compounding, uh, we use this special formula, okay, where we use this E, okay, uh, this E uh, epsilon concept of principal times E to the power of J times T. J is still your nominal interest rate. T is the number of years, okay, in, uh, the time period in years. Okay. And to find the present value, you just rearrange the formula. P, which is now the present value, is future value divided by E times J times T, E to the power of J times T, which is basically equals to future value times E to the power of negative J times T, because it's a reciprocal over here. Okay. Um, so this is some of the uh, examples. For continuous compounding, it's, it's quite straightforward. You just have to know how to apply this formula. Okay. So you can... Uh, see and, and make sure that you know how to use your calculator to go and find e to the power of something right okay let's uh, uh, stop there first and then we will continue with the uh, annuity okay let's go to annuity so annuity is um, a series of level amount okay? and this is um, just to show you the, the difference between a single amount that we have seen earlier Okay, when you put in 100 and you are interested to see how much it's worth in five years time. Okay, so annuity is a level recurring amount. Okay, recurring amount. So in this case, every year, okay, $100 is deposited in the bank. A mixed cash flow is mixed. Okay, so you can have a, a variety of numbers along the timeline. Okay, so our focus now is on annuity here which is a level cash flow. And I explained to you the uh, some conceptual uh, background of uh, annuity, whereby it's basically the same cash flow can be used for both, uh, in this case, the uh, borrower and the bank, for example. They have the same cash flow, except now that uh, 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 the, the interest of the bank would be to look at the future value, whereas the uh, interest of the borrower would be on the present value, for example. Okay? And there are two types of annuity, ordinary and uh, annuity due. Ordinary annuity is when the uh, cash flow occurs at the end of the period. And annuity due is when it occurs at the beginning of the period. Okay, So there are some um, modifications in the formula if you want to calculate annuity due. But the default case is... Um, for annuity is that uh, if the question does not specify whether it's ordinary or it's annuity due, then we will assume that it is ordinary or, or in most cases. So this is the timeline of ordinary annuity. This is the timeline of uh, annuity due. Okay? So it's, it's still five-year annuity except that it occurs now. Okay, It occurs now Okay, and if you want to calculate the future value, for example, at the end of five years, okay, there will be a one extra period of compounding okay, for annuity due. So this is shown in the example here. Okay, as I said, 
um, we need to simplify. Okay, for five years, it's okay for you to calculate manually like this. But uh, if it is 20 years or 50 years, then of course you don't want to, to calculate manually one by one. So you need a shortcut formula. Okay, so luckily there is a shortcut formula for annuity. So for future value, it's a PMT. PMT refers to the annuity payment. Okay, uh, so payment does not necessarily means you have something that you pay. It can also refer to something that you receive. Okay, uh, so it can be payment made or paid or payment received. It does not matter. So what is the formula for future value? It's simply one plus I to the power of N minus one, right? Make sure you bracket them, okay? And divide by I, okay? Divide by I, and all of this, this is a, what we call the future value annuity factor, okay? And you multiply it with the uh, payment, okay? The, the annuity payment. So let's look at the example. The okay, example is uh, as before, uh, whereby $100, okay? Uh, per year, okay? Interest rate is 10%. And for five years, so applying, uh, plugging in the, the 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 figures in the formula, your PMT is one hundred, interest rate is ten percent, and for five years, okay. Remember, you need to find this first, okay, which is one point one to the power of five, and then you minus one, okay, equals to a number, and all of this you divide by zero point one first, which is ten you percent know, interest rate, equals to a number, and that number. Then only you multiply with 100. So you will get 610.51. Okay. Uh, this other example, 1,500 okay, per year at the end of the year. So this per year here uh, shows that this is an annuity. So the question does not have to specify that oh, this is an annuity. Okay. So uh, per year here signals or shows that it is an annuity already. And this is uh, ordinary annuity, end of the year, five years, okay, 4.5% interest rate. Okay? And um, calculate the amount of savings at the end of year five. So this per year also means that uh, frequency of compounding should be tally, which is uh, annual basis. That's why M equals to one. If it is per month, then M equals to 12, right? So what is the future value of annuity? Apply a uh, plug-in in the formula. A PMT is 1.5, right? Interest rate 4.5%, so plus 1, and then to power of 5, altogether minus 1. Okay, and this figure here, you divide by 0 0.045 before multiplying it with 1,500. So you get 8206.07. So now, uh, similar uh, uh, case, but now, Assume that you receive um, now, starting now, instead of starting a year from today. So this is an annuity due uh, case. Okay? So if it is annuity due, uh, what happens is that your 1,500 uh, occurs now, which is uh, earlier, right? So we know the focal point still remain at the end of year five. Okay? So we know for a fact that there will be an additional interest because of extra one um, year or one period uh, compounding. So if that's the case, we modify the formula slightly. Okay? This remains the same, okay? but since this is uh, annuity due, so you multiply with one plus I okay? to show that there is an extra one period of compounding. Right? So applying this uh, formula, we will get uh, uh, future value to be 8575, which is higher than 8206 earlier. Okay? And the difference is 369.27, which is the one uh, uh, period, compounding period uh, interest. How about present value? For present value, we also have a formula. It looks similar, but there's a slight uh, difference. Okay, The difference now is you begin with, for the factor, eh, for the annuity factor, it's 1 minus 1 plus i to the power of negative n. So be careful. For future value earlier, it is uh, 1 plus i to the power of n first, then minus 1. But for present value, it's 1 minus 1 plus i to the power of negative n. And then you still divide by i okay, before multiplying with the uh, NVT payment. Okay? 
So this is a, a, an example. Find the present value of an ordinary annuity of $100 per year for five years at 10%. So it turns out to be 379.08. Okay. This is another example similar as earlier, 1,500. Next five years, 4.5%. But now you need to calculate the present value. Earlier, you would calculate the future value. Okay, same context, 1,005, five years, 4.5%. But now your, your perspective would be, your focal point would be now, okay, i.e. the present value. Okay, so this is your timeline. It, it, it helps okay, if you draw the cut timeline first right before uh, attempting to answer the question. So the focal point, uh, focal point now is today in applying the uh, present value, you will get uh, one five as the PMT or the payment, okay, annuity payment, 4.5%. Remember, one minus and eh, one minus 1.05 to the power of negative five, altogether divided by 0 0.045, which will get 6584.97. And of course, this present uh, value, if you multiply with one plus i, which is 1.045, you will get to the power of five, uh, you will get 8206.807, uh, okay? which is a future value in example 16. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, because of the same context, okay, depending on your focal point, it will be future or present value, they are interchangeable or it's, uh, it, it, it uh, shows you okay, uh, the, the same value, okay, interchangeable. Okay? And now um, that's to annuity due, okay? similar example, but payment is made at the beginning uh, of the year, right? So at the beginning of the year, so what happened now is, right? Your focal point, point now is here. Earlier, the focal point starts here at the end of year one, right? So since the focal point now is uh, immediately, okay? So the 1,500 that will occur or that you will make at the beginning, starting now, it will not be compounded. Okay? The rest will be compounded as uh, usual, but the first one will not be compounded because it occurs now immediately. Okay? The compounding will only occur at the end of the year. So because of that, we need to make slight modification. Okay? So the annual, the annuity payment okay, that you will make or you will get Okay, immediately okay, at the beginning is denoted here as PMT in whole without compounding. Okay? So that leaves you with less one, okay, less one number of uh, annuity. So in this case, uh, it's a five year annuity. So minus the, the first PMT, you will uh, have only four okay, PMT that will be compounded. Okay? So this minus one is reflected here. Okay? Uh, 1 minus 1 plus i to the power of negative n plus 1. Why do you plus 1? Okay? Because n is in negative, negative n. So to make it less 1 uh, period, you have to plus 1 okay, to make it uh, less 1. So negative 5 plus 1 will become negative 4. It's okay? showing you uh, the, the four uh, annuities that are compounded okay, during the four period, the four years. So applying this formula, okay, you can apply this to this example, okay, whereby uh, the 1,005 that you will make at the first year will not be compounded or discounted. So that will leave you only 4. Okay, so this negative 4 is a result of negative 5 plus 1. Okay? So you will get uh, 6881.29. Uh, I better make uh, the correction here. Uh, this one is to the power of five. In case you got confused, right? Okay, so for annuity also, we can find the uh, period, but the period uh, now is in terms of number of payments. Okay? How many annuities, hmm? uh, how many payments? And we can also find I later. Okay, to find the number of payments, i.e. the periods, Right, you still apply log. Okay. Similarly, you apply log, except now uh, there are uh, a much 
more layers involved okay, because there are uh, more terms okay, uh, involved in annuity. But effectively, it's still the same, whereby you, you separate the end to the left-hand side and what remains on the right-hand side okay, is the uh, variation. If the um, you reshuffle the, uh, the terms okay, okay, and you still lock uh, both sides, okay, starting from uh, this term here. Okay, you start from rearranging okay, this term okay, before applying the, the lock. Again, I said don't, you don't have to, to memorize, you just need to arrange them accordingly. Okay, let's look at this example. Okay, uh, you need to accumulate 10K, you can save 200 per month, interest 6%. Okay, so what you need to do, you arrange them accordingly, and you know that this you can apply future value of uh, annuity here. Okay, so your future value amount is 10K, PMT is 200, interest is. Uh, a nominal interest is 6%, but of course you need to divide by 12 because this is monthly and to the power of N, N is what you want to solve okay, and divide it by uh, I. Remember your I is 6% divided by 12 because of the monthly compounding. Okay? And you simplify the, the terms 10K divided by 200 is 50, right? And what you get is uh, 1.005 to the power of N minus 1 equals to 0. 5 okay this minus one you transfer to the right hand side it becomes 1.25 and you lock both sides okay and finally you solve for for n okay and n is 44.74 of course you have to divide by 12 to get the years which is 3.73 uh, years okay that is finding the time period of course, interest rate is a little bit uh, 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 tricky okay uh, because your I here, you can't solve using the algebra we have seen earlier. Earlier was a sim single amount, straightforward. But for annuity, because you have I appear in two places, okay, it, uh, it, it also appear in the, it, it appears in the numerator okay, uh, and in exponential form. So that's why you can't solve it directly. Some textbooks say you use try and error method where you apply many eyes and test to see what is the closest answer. Okay. Some suggest using financial calculator, of course. Okay. This is more direct, most, uh, uh, much simpler approach. Over here, I'm going to teach you the, try, uh, the combination of, you start off with trying at one or two rates first, then you apply the interpolation. Excuse me. Okay, how is this is done, right? So let's use this uh, simple example, basic example. Your friend wants to borrow three thousand from you. She offers to repay you one thousand every year. Okay, so every year she denotes an annuity. Okay, so this is a three, uh, sorry, four years annuity because uh, for four years. So your friend will pay you one thousand per year for four years. You um, by borrowing three thousand from you today, okay. so we are interested to, to to calculate what is the interest rate uh, implied here. Okay, uh, in this case, so you write down the the basic line here. Three thousand is the present value of annuity. Okay, because when you borrow, you will get that three thousand immediately. So that reflects the present value, and it is an annuity because the payment is made one thousand every year. For how long? For four years. So what would be the interest rate? So since it appears twice here, okay, in this uh, in this uh, formula, so we can't solve it directly. But what we can do is that you start with a logical uh, 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 rate to try first, and in most cases, uh, in in exams, tests, or textbook we will make it uh, not far from 10%, okay? So when you try I uh, at 10%, so what you need to do is you plug in this 10% that you want to try into the formula, to, okay, into this formula here. And by trying at 10%, you will get the answer of 3169. And you compare this with the 3000, and you will see that this 3169 is above 3000. 
okay uh, so above so how does that help you to move forward so you will know that uh, it is high so you need to try at another rate okay that will uh, make the value go down to be close to three thousand and since this is a, a present value so you know that you will try at a higher interest rate since the inverse relationship remember okay so by trying at a slightly higher interest rate you will make the present value comes down okay? so let's say it's at 12 percent just for example and at 12 percent you will get a present value of 3073 which is still above 3000 right um so you need to try at a slightly higher rate so by trying at 13 percent you will get 2974 so it crosses 3000 once it crosses 3000 you can stop and start with the interpolation okay so what happened here is you have three rates okay, with three different present value for interpolation you need to choose two of course um, you choose uh, 13 percent okay and you choose 12 percent okay you don't use 10 percent because you already have the 12 percent that gives you 3073 so uh, by interpolate between these two it will give you a much better answer than interpolating between 10 percent and 13 percent okay so at 12 percent the present value is 3073 at 13 percent the present value is 2974 your objective is to find the rate that will give the present value exactly three percent Okay, so using interpolation, this uh, twelve percent minus i divided by twelve percent minus thirteen percent on the left. This is the left hand side. Okay, you make it equals to the right hand side, which is three zero seven five three zero three seven point three five minus three thousand, the corresponding uh, present value of both interest rates, divided by three zero seven point three five minus two nine seven four point four seven. From here on, it's all mathematics. Okay, the interest will be to solve for i. So you do this uh, carefully using your calculator and you will get your i equals to 12.59%. Once you get that 12.9%, you check whether or not it's actually be in between. Okay? okay, so you notice that 12.59% is indeed sandwiched between 12% and 13%. Uh, so you are on the right track. Okay. And then we have uh, perpetuities. Okay, perpetuities are perpetual cash flow, okay, meaning it is continuous or never ending, right? So since it is continuous or never ending, okay, so you can find the present value of the perpetuity. It's a special case whereby to find the present value of a perpetuity, you simply need to know the uh, perpetual okay, perpetuity amount, right? Divided by the corresponding uh, rate. So if it is involving money, banking, insurance, you divide by interest rate. If it's uh, regarding investment, you divide by the rate of return. Okay. So in this case, uh, there is an investment which offers a perpetual cash flow of five hundred dollars every year. Okay. So since this is perpetual, okay, or perpetuity, and since you know that the required rate of return here is eight percent, to find the value or present value of this investment, simply the PMT or the perpetuity of $500 divided by 8%, which is equals to 6,215. Okay, so that is perpetuity. So the, during class, we will discuss some of the mixed uh, cash flows uh, problem to, to strengthen uh, your understanding on the uh, uh, future value, present value for both single and also annuity okay uh, can be reinforced uh, much further by by going through some of the examples in this uh, mixed uh, cash flows okay so i see you all in in class uh, thank you